You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management, along with Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian and Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That music means our broadcast week has commenced here. On the Options Insider Radio Network. Yep, it's time for the Option Block, your bi-weekly source for all things options related. My name is Mark Longo from the OptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from this fun network. Hopefully you guys are staying safe, staying sane out there in these topsy-turvy times. Hopefully we can bring you a little dose of sanity here multiple times a day <laughs> on the network. And, of course, if you like what you're hearing, make sure you leave those questions, those comments those insights, those pearls of wisdom. Send the comments and questions to us. Leave the reviews on your platforms of choice so folks can continue to discover this dose of sanity here on their podcast device of choice. Maybe their streaming device. Maybe they want to stream it on their desktop to YouTube or other ways. We don't judge. If you want to get it live, join us on Mixler every Monday and Thursday, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern for this show. There's other shows that go out live too, Crypto, Options, Boot Camp, OPR, all that good stuff. OPR, not so much on the live front, but a bunch of other ones there. Twifo, of course, Volviews, you name it. If you want your live fix, we got you covered. If you want your on-demand fix, we got you even more covered. Uh, so keep those questions and comments and those reviews coming. We do love to hear from you on all the different devices and platforms out there. Let's see who we're hearing from today. First, let's go out to the quiet, the sane, the tranquil hinterlands of these here United States. Yep, I'm talking about Maine, the former, <laughs> the once and perhaps future options mecca of these fine United States, where I'm joined once again by the rockingest of lobsters, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com by way of Carmen Lyon Capital. Mr. G, welcome back to the show, sir. It is a huge pleasure to be back. Huge. It's as big a pleasure as I could think of when it comes to, you know, option radio broadcasts. It is a pretty fun pleasure, particularly when you put it in that very narrow context. Then, yes, indeed. We blow the doors off, and it's time for us to blow the doors off the markets. It is time for the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Trading Block, the portion of the show where we break down what the heck is trading, what is lighting up ye old markets today, and another weird one, another kind of bifurcated market. Kind of depends where you're looking to depend what kind of day it is, and it is kind of a rinse and repeat day. Maybe some optimistic news on the vaccine front, but perhaps not as optimistic maybe as some had hoped. Others looking, of course, at the, the virus impact news, you know, health-wise, economic-wise, that's growing more dire by the day. Other areas like California and others threatening to lock down yet again. So it's kind of a glass half full, glass half empty kind of market. But the markets look like it's mostly feeling half full because most of the major indices are in rally ho mode right now. We're seeing the NASDAQ leading the charge up over 1.5%, 1.64%. 
right now we're seeing the S&P up not quite as much, about not quite four-tenths of a percent out there. Then we've got small caps feeling a little bit of the weight out there off about th- almost three-quarters of a percent. And then, of course, our old friend Dow, a.k.a. the old world economy, off not quite two-tenths of a percent to the dark side. So it's a very weird market. Depends where you hang your hat, what kind of day you're having out there. In terms of all things VIX come into showtime, we saw our old friend VIX breaking the 25 handle down to 24 and three quarters. That puts it down about three and a quarter points from last show. And so far, not looking so good for my Vol Views prognostication. But we know how this game is played, listeners. We've got a whole week for my prognostication to come to light for the worm to turn. We'll see if that happens out there. Also looking out to VIX land, which is, of course, the volatility of volatility. And we're seeing that at about 114 and change, about 114 and a quarter. That puts it down not much, about not even a point, about three quarters of a point from our last show. So still hovering, still kind of locked around that 115 level, which is still pretty frothy, still pretty elevated. Showing that vol has some vol these days. And our old friend VXX, the ETP, all you guys like to fade out there. Uh, that's looking all right right now. <laughs> it's at 29 and a quarter. It puts it down about three handles from our last show. So as VIX comes in, we're seeing VXX coming in as well out there. A lot to unpack, but first, let me go out to that rockingest of lobsters. It's been a little while since we chatted with him. Mr. Rock Lobster, sir, what is lighting up your tape and the tape of your crazies in the pit chat these days, sir? Well, you know what's? I find something odd. <laughs> you you get no good Corona news. California, like all these, some of these states, oh, we're going to go back to shutting things down. Um, the case numbers go up, but S and P five hundred is continuing to rally. So, um, you know what the heck? That's all I can say. Um, I was just uh, looking at. Uh, um, a lot of our, uh, in pitch chat wise, um, I just add another uh, VIX, uh, like a little VIX back spread, just because we have like a crazy uh, vol premium in the futures, you know, the short term realized vol has just gotten smeared in the SPX. So, we, so we've had kind of that steady crunch of vol, but the back end of vol is very high. So it kind of does distorts volatility a little bit. Um but VIX is 24.59, and if we close a dime lower or something, I think that will be the low close since the pandemic started. Um, so we're right at – it's a significant number, right? We are, um, we are 61 cents away from getting out of the danger zone. Um, so all of that stuff, it's is uh, an inflection point, and for whatever reason, equity buyers think – <laughs> we are past this COVID thing, um, even though all of the headline news does not say anything about that, although you can dig in and, I, you know, obviously it's, it's I think it's become just a political debate now, football. Um, doesn't mean it's not serious, but it seems that it's becoming highly, highly politicized and it seems it's going to get more that way as we get into November. So however that works out, it works out. But all I know is people that are betting with their own money are saying stocks are going up. And ball is going down, and we're almost at that point for the low of the pandemic. So you have to have a low before you can make a new low, and that's the way ball works. So um, that's where we are. So very um, – um, and also looking for a ton of huge tech earnings. Um, Netflix was kind of, you know, kind of a not much going on, but we've got uh, Tesla and Google and Microsoft and Amazon and just everybody – everything is coming out here in the next week. So – you know, it it could be a big, uh, I don't know what everybody's expecting, to be honest. Um, like, what, everything's going to be great. I'm not really sure how that all works. Um, but for right now, they're driving the ball down today. That's all I'm going to say. So um, it's a pretty substantial, substantial ball crush. Let's put it that way. It is a substantial vol crush. And let's see who else we have joining us here. Better late than never. Fashionably late. We have the unclest of mics, Mr. Uncle Mike Tussauds, sir. What is lighting up your tape on this half Uncle Mike day, half not so much, sir? You know, it's frustrating in that we're positive for the year and then we're negative for the year. We're like right at my numbers in a lot of different ways. So um, you're right. It is like a half Uncle Mike day. And uh, for any of you that have nieces or nephews out there, you try being an uncle and just doing it halfway. It's a very difficult thing to do. So 
I think that just where we are right now, the, the market's kind of waiting and playing wait and see right now for the earnings. Uh, I think that I, I don't know about COVID at this point and that uh, Andrew's right. It's that we don't get any good COVID news. Markets go higher. And it seems like I would agree. It's definitely very politicized, but uh, I think it's very important that everyone be as careful as they can be out there, whether you're a mask person or a non-mask person. I hate those masks, that evil government. But the reality of it is, is that could it stop and help someone a little bit? Yeah. And if you think you're breathing in your own carbon dioxide, then I think it's a miracle that surgeons have survived this long wearing those masks all day. So I think we still need to be careful, but I also know that uh, if we don't uh, open our economy, it just doesn't work. <laughs> so we got to kind of work together on this one. And um, I think what's going to happen is that both political parties will come together. We'll be one as a nation. Oh, no, no. Just kidding. That would be foolish. <laughs> um, but I think that uh, if we work together on this, then we can do a lot of good things with this. We can come out of this better than we were before, honestly, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or somewhere uh, in between or further left or further right. So right now, if the market stays negative or ends up negative on the day, then won't be doing anything. But at the end of the day, if we're positive, I might be putting on some more positions. So uh, very uh, confusing day for me. But uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to do what I can. And uh, if we're negative, I'll try and make a little bit of money here and there selling some spreads or something along those lines. But if we go positive, game on. And that's what's going on with me today. Let's see what's going on with these fun, fun markets out there today. Let's start in the big boys, the big indices out here. Decent paper actually coming into uh, part way through the show here. We're seeing VIX. You know, VIX has kind of been languishing of late. It is that time of year, listeners. It is that seasonally quiet time, usually outside of pandemic madness times. <laughs> These are usually quiet times. And so we're seeing VIX ADV kind of reflecting that, threatening to break 400K to uh, the downside. In fact, I do believe it has done that now. Let's see, ADB is, yeah, 323. Uh, this number is from our last show, so it's fallen off quite a bit even since our last show is at 323 right now. But doing decent paper today, 352. So probably going to see that number bumping up a little bit. SPY, same deal, about one and three quarters million contracts as of a few minutes ago. The ADB is right around 5 million. Uh, the S at not quite half a million contracts, 476,000. ADV just a tick north of a million uh, the Q is 561,000, the ADV 979,000, and the Russell 2000 through the IWM lens at about 262,000 contracts. Let's go to the top 10 most active options that you guys are trading out there right now. The single names cost you 168,000 contracts to break into the top 10 today, which is decent. It's not blowing the doors off, but it's also not nothing either. And that gets you all the way to Moderna. This is a newcomer to the top 10. They, of course, on the biosciences and drug side here, looking for vaccines for everyone's favorite ill these days, the pandemic. This is a name that doesn't usually do a lot of paper. Their ADV is 101,000. That's actually decent for them. Today already having 168,000, 169,000 on the tape right now. So pretty active day for Moderna out there. Number nine, Amazon, 194,000, a perennial top tenor these days. So pretty much get to get to number nine, you're already up to almost 200K. That's a big leap. Uh, number eight, Bank of America, 196,000. Then we get to our electric car duo here. Number seven, Nikola, 217,000. Number six, Tesla, 228,000. Number five, Microsoft, a little bit north of a quarter million, 254 on the tape. For Microsoft, number four, AMD, back in the top part of the top 10 here, 260,000 contracts. Number three, uh, we've got another newcomer. It's an interesting day out here in the, uh, in the top 10 here, AstraZeneca, ticker symbol AZN, 261,000 contracts. Another, again, newcomer. Let's see what their ADV is. Uh, their ADV is 49,000 contracts. So big day for AstraZeneca out there, 261,000 contracts. 91% of that, some of the most concentrated paper we've seen in some time in the top 10, 91% of that coming on the call side of the ledger, listeners. Number two, of course, Apple uh, out there, 315,000. That means what the hell? Tesla's number six. Apple's number two. What the heck could possibly be number one? Oh, wait. Going back to electric cars again, but it's not Nikola. It's the other end electric car company, Neo. Looking at China this time, 372 thousand contracts all in all pretty active day even if the top spot 
isn't exactly blowing our doors off 400, 500, 600,000 contracts. Speaking of blowing our doors off, let's see if the world is blowing our doors off these days. It's time to break down the global. We talk about all the time about the OCC numbers here, but that's just one slice of the apple out there in the global perspective out there, right, listeners? So let's break it down. How's the world looking? from an overall derivatives perspective. And our friends over at FIA have done just that. That's the Futures Industry Association. They released their 2020 first half data for global futures and options volume. And some of it is a similar story. Others, not so much. A global volume on the futures and options side, so global derivatives here, grew by 32%, hitting a record-setting almost $22 billion, 21.9 billion contracts in the first half of this year, that's compared to last year, so a big gain here this year. Uh, second quarter, the total number of traded contracts was $10.46 billion. That's actually, surprisingly enough, that's actually down from Q1. So Q1 was the big dog out there, but not too much, about a billion contracts different. That's down 8.4% from the then record-setting 11.41 billion contracts they traded in Q1 21, Q1 2020, I should say, but that's still up 21%, almost 22% from Q2 of 2019. That's very confusing. So let me say that again. Uh, we had 10.46 billion contracts here in Q2. That's up 21, nearly 22% from last year this time, but also down about 8.4% from Q1 of this year. So it depends on the frame of reference how you parse that. A Q2 volume higher than any other quarter ever, of course, with the exception of Q1 of this year. So historic, except for that first quarter. Pay no attention. Uh, to that first quarter out there. Now, you get more interesting when you start digging down into these numbers a little bit because you see all that volume and like, man, positions must be growing by exponential leaps and bounds. And yet that's not really the case. OI, total OI at the end of June was 915 million contracts. That's up only 3.4% from June of 2019. So what that means is we saw a lot of churn and burn, listeners, over the course of Q1 and Q2, people putting some on, taking off really quickly. The amount of size, long-term positioning out there and big, massive position changes, actually not that huge, which is kind of surprising. I would have wagered that that OI change would have been a bit higher, just from the explosion, the fire hose of volume that we saw out there. If you want to know where the paper is coming from, uh, Asia Pacific had the largest increase in trading volume, followed, of course, by us, North America, and then Latin America, But Latin America grew almost twice as rapidly, percentage-wise, as Europe did. That's, of course, they're coming, starting from a smaller base out there. If you're wondering which assets are driving the tape there, well, it's equities. Equities across the board, across the globe, lead in the dance. Trading volume, equity index, futures, and options up 51% compared to Q1 of, excuse me, of the first half of 2019. And uh, single stock products up 34%. So that's, that's indices versus single names. Out there, equity products accounting for 59% of total volume for the first half of this year and 67% of total open interest at the end of the year. So, wow, equity is just dominating the tape compared to interest rates and others. No one really seems to care about rates <laughs> uh, right now. Commodities doing decent paper up about double digits, uh, the activity out there. But so without, except for non precious metals, they were actually down. If you wonder where the top dog is, it's not CME. It's actually the National Stock Exchange of India. Uh, 3.73 billion contracts traded in the first half of the year. That's up 38% from last year. CME number two, 2.78 billion contracts. That's up 13%. And then we've got some others out there, ICE and B3 and others. So there you go. A little bit of a global perspective on all things options out there. Meanwhile, let's turn our attention here to a little bit more micro, a little bit more domestic. Well, before I do that really quickly, Mr. Rock Lobster, Mr. Uncle Mike, Either of you surprised or perhaps flummoxed by those numbers, the fact that we saw so much trading in Q1 and Q2, but the OI kind of not really budging. Does that surprise either of you? I was surprised if India was up on top like they were. That was one I was not expecting. I didn't know that there was that much popularity outside of Maine. <laughs> um, yeah, with the open, I, I just think maybe there was, uh, I think because the market is such a huge V. You know, you you bought stuff, you closed it. I mean, you had such a massive move. Um, I just think people were taking their money. I mean, you know, Amazon goes from fifteen hundred to three thousand. How long are you going to hold your call for? You know, <laughs> it's kind of a big move. Kind of a big move, and you know, we talk about equities a lot, even on shows like Twifo. There's a reason. It's because equities are freaking dominating the tape 
these days right now, listeners. And that's kind of where all the action is. What was that number again? 67% of total global open interest at the end of June was equity products. Bear that in mind. If you're saying, man, how come you talk about equity so much? I'm like, Twyfo. <laughs> how come not fluid milk? Because that's not 67% of all the open interest out there. All right, let's move on to some other more domestically focused equities here. Earnings popping off in a big way out here. Probably also contributing to some of this weird bifurcation we're seeing out there in the market. Halliburton today popping off as well as good old Beamer and Logitech after the bell today as well. Halliburton before the bell. Uh, Tomorrow we got Coke, Snap, United Airlines, GD Ameritrade, one of their probably last ones as as a standalone entity before they join the global Schwab empire. Got iRobot out there making the Roombas. Uh, what else we've got up here? And Wednesday, NASDAQ, Tesla, a name you may have heard of once or twice. Tesla and good old Microsoft and Chipotle, the former stealth Apple, on Wednesday. Wednesday, a big day. Thursday, Twitter, AT&T, American Airlines, Southwest, a.k.a. Love, Intel, a.k.a. my old stomping grounds, a.k.a. INTC. And then we got E-Trade, Dow, Skechers, Discover, Card, if you into such things. Friday, got Verizon, Amex, and uh, Honeywell. Right, let's see what we've got. All the earnings move, earnings move results reports. Let's pop off a few. IBM popping off after the bell today. Time of this report, they were at one twenty five eleven. Uh, their straddle price was six dollars and eleven cents. In the past, they've moved six dollars and seventy four cents. So pricing a little bit of light vol. We'll see if that's merited after the bell today. By the way, of course, you guys, as always, can get all these reports and a lot more at theoptionsinsider.com. Let's see what else is up here. Chipotle. The Stealth Apple. <laughs> I'm not sure if you saw the headlines, listeners, but they're going to start adding to their stores Chipotle lanes to add drive throughs to their stores. And that name, that name just tickled my fancy. It made me want to go get a burrito just to, just to reward them for such a clever marketing gimmick. I want, to, I want to drive through a Chipotle lane. I'll admit it. It worked on me. So there we go. Let's see if the Chipotle lanes is working from an earnings vol perspective. Timeless report, there were 11.36.22. So Chipotle, pretty rich. Uh, out there, they were pricing in seventy-seven dollars and ninety cents. In the past, they've moved ninety-seven dollars and thirty-four cents. So it seems like folks pricing in a little bit less vol right now, which is interesting. So I guess Salmonella fear is behind them. Maybe they're not excited about the Chipotle lanes like I am. I guess we'll find out. Snap twenty-four fifty-four timeless report. They were pricing in three dollars and thirty-six cents on that straddle. In the past, they've moved four dollars and forty-eight cents. Snap looking light. From a vol perspective, let's go out to Softy. I called them before. I've called them back in the day. They were the most reliable premium right in the business. These days, not so much. Let's see how much juice you're getting. Spoiler alert, you're getting some juice to write some Softy here. Microsoft was at 202.88 as of the time of this report. They were pricing in, get this, listeners, $9.82, nearly 10 bucks for that at the money straddle in Softy. In the past, they moved less than five. $4.76. So someone's pricing in a whole heck of a whopping amount of juice in good old Microsoft. Let's see if it's merited. Let's see, or perhaps if the overwriters will keep a good chunk of that. Let's go out to Twitter. Twitter's on the 23rd. They are at $35.81 on this report here. They're pricing in not quite 4 bucks, $3.96. In the past, they've moved $4.81. So light on the vol side for Twitter. Intel, 60 bucks even. On this report, they were pricing in $2.84, and they in the past have moved $3.17. Let's see, a couple more here, then we'll move on into the odd block. I just I could parse these for days. Uh, Honeywell here, they were at $155 even, pricing in $6.45. In the past, they moved $3.48. Wow, some juice. Some juice lurking in them thar hills in Honeywell. Let's see if cell phones can deliver as well. Verizon. They're on the Friday before the bell. Fifty-six dollars and thirty cents. They're pricing in a buck thirty-five. In the past, they moved a buck ten. So a little bit of juice, not quite as sexy as perhaps some of the other ones out there. But it's a cell phone company. What do you what do you expect out there? Meanwhile, it's time for you to expect us to get weird and get wild. Yes, it is time for the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All 
right, everybody. Welcome to the part of the show where we get weird, we get wild. It is time for the odd block. Yep. Let's see what we got on our tape today as we unleash our eye of Sauron out here. What did he or she find? Let's see. It's a surprise to me, too. So that always makes it fun. Going to kick it off a newcomer to the odd block out here. We've got Johnson Controls International, ticker symbol JCI. This is an Irish domiciled multinational conglomerate. Well, that tells me absolutely nothing. Thank you very much. Well, they produce fire and HVAC equipment and security equipment for buildings. <laughs> so there you go. Irish security and HVAC manufacturer out here. Ticker symbol JCI. Trading right now $36.88 off nearly $0.80 cents, or about a little over 2%. Been an interesting year for JCI. A year ago, they were trading a little bit north of here. They're about 41 bucks, actually, exactly. And then they trended up over that time to a high of about 44, almost 45 bucks, not quite. And at the time of the big sell off, right, right before it happened, they were at 42, 45. Then they got slammed like everybody else in February. By the middle of March, they were trading 22, 78. They got down that low. Then they kind of bounced back. Within a few weeks, they were trading over 30 bucks again, 30, 60. And they bopped up to 36, 81 in. Early June, June 8th, and then they kind of sold off again to 33 and changed and back up to where they are now, almost 37 before coming off the other side of it. Actually, 36, 37, 67 yesterday and their last session, I should say, and then selling off again today here to where they are right now. A little bit shy of the 37 handle. All right, that's where our table has been set. Let's see what our Eye of Sauron has found out here. First off, we've got, let's see, Oc40s, October, going out to October out here. Let's see. These are the Oc40 calls going up for one buck, seven thousand four hundred and twenty-four times. Right on the bid, they were buck bid at a buck thirty-five. The bid was only good for one hundred eighty. This guy said, "You know what? I'm going to take seven thousand four hundred and twenty-four, if you please." And he's done more since then. A total of ten thousand of these bad boys have traded on the day. There are earnings between now and October. The next cycle is on July thirty-first, so coming up here in a few weeks. So it looks like a little bit of the old earnings premium harvesting out here, plus a little bit extra. Mr. Rock Lobster, someone deciding if they get back up to 40, they'll get rid of it, and they'll get rid of it effectively at 41 bucks, and they're happy to do so, which isn't that bad of a level, given what we've seen out here. If not, they'll take their dollar and they'll keep it. Thank you very much. What's your take here on someone overwriting to the upside in JCI, sir? Well, if you think about it, um, you know what's funny? A, a small anecdote here for Maine, you cannot buy certain building materials. There has been so much building and fixing up of stuff. Um, like you can't buy pressure treated wood. Um, like there's shortages of stuff. Um, so I guess all of this lockdown stuff, everybody's buying, um, uh, everybody's buying, you know, uh, <laughs> buying, a. Buying materials, so Johnson Controls they make HVAC stuff. You know, it it could happen. Um, the stock was, geez, Louise, it's only in the thirty three bucks a week ago, or you know, a week and a half ago, and now it's trading thirty. So I can see why they want to sell the forty call. So you know, it makes sense. It's a, a yield play. It gets them out at ten, eleven, twelve percent from where they are. So uh, it, as it appears right now, they look quite happy about that. They do indeed. We'll keep an eye on these to see if they are still happy in a little bit out there. As we go on to our next name, I hope we'll listen to be watched. We'll come back. Meanwhile, it's the name that more of you probably are familiar with than these Irish multinationals out here. <laughs> Let's go out to good old Beamer. I haven't checked in on Beamer in some time. Was the uh, the big dog out there on the SIBO back in the day, the big equity option, the big pit. Multiple floor brokers, all sorts of good stuff where a lot of people cut their teeth clerking and stuff, including myself out there. A good old Beamer, different beast these days. IBM, 126 and a half right now, up a buck 36 or a little over 1%, about 1.1%. Good day for the old Beamer out here. Let's see. Let's look at the year that's been out here in IBM. A year ago, they were trading one, almost 150, 149 and three quarters. So well shy of that, obviously. They topped out right before the sell-off at 153 and change. Looks like they got all, all the way up to 158 and three quarters, actually, somewhere in that madness. And then, of course, the sell-off came 
and the madness started. And they got down to a low of ninety dollars and fifty six cents before rebounding again. Within a few weeks, they were back up to about one thirteen, and then a few weeks after that, they were back up to about one twenty eight, almost one twenty nine. So north of where they are right now. And then they got up to, over the last few weeks, they got up to 135.75 back on June 8th. So June 8th was the high for a lot of these names. And then selling off again down to recently, it was down to 115 and three quarters. And now it's back on the upswing again, up in about a little more than 10 bucks here, about 11 bucks in good old Beamer since that low recently. So a bit of an upswing recently, but it's been a kind of bunch of failed stops and starts other than that for good old IBM, but still off their low here of 95 and change back in March. Let's see what we got here. Looks like someone maybe is agreeing with that sentiment out here, saying, you know what, it's been failing to make some upside here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some juice and get the heck out of Dodge. So two for two here, it seems like, on the overriding side. This time we got the SEP 135s going up 4,500 times for a buck 88. Again on the bid, this was bid for 10 contracts on the NOM for a buck 88. This goes to show you, listeners, how sometimes this displayed size is deceptive because this guy got 4,500 off on a bid that was good for 10 uh, so he did this on the ARCA over. Actually, no, the bid was on the NOM, so it looks like he did one up there. Either way, there are earnings. They are today, like you mentioned, after the bell. So interesting choice. Someone overriding saying, you know what? I'm fading this earnings. I don't care about this. And I'm going to take this massive vol crush that happens after earnings and take my nice, hefty, nearly two bucks on these 135s. And if the stock rallies 10 bucks and I get stopped out at 135, I'm guessing this guy won't be too sad. About that either. Mr. Meatball, or excuse me, Mr. Rock Lobster, is that your take as well, sir? You think someone's just getting a bit of the old earning shine and, and harvesting it as fast as he can and damn the consequences, sir? It, it feels like that because, I mean, look at the NASDAQ rally today and the earnings. I mean, people are pumping things up. So I, I feel if you're going to sell calls against some stock and you're okay being taken out, uh, today feels like, I would say, a tech-free shot day to sell some calls on the upside. You get taken out of your buy rights or whatever. Uh, you make money. But, I mean, this is, a, this is a spot, like 32 and change or whatever, that we keep uh, bouncing off of. So it's not going to uh, – it does not look like a bad idea, to be honest. Yeah, it's kind of hard to fault this guy. We can put this in the to be watch category as well because it's very close. I got a feeling idea. We're going to know tomorrow how well this guy did <laughs> or not because this is mostly an earnings story. He's not going to wait to sap. If he's smart, he's not going to because if his erosion goes his way, he's going to get the heck out of Dodge and take most of that buck 88 with him. Otherwise, perhaps not so much. Uh, let's see. But sometimes, you know, if you if you're, you have a level, you're happy to do so and get out of the stock and the market's willing to give you a lot of extra juice. Just for that, there are times when trading around earnings makes a wee bit of sense, and that seems like it might be one of them. We're going to come back to it. We'll see. Watch the stock go to 200, and this guy's going to be crying in his milk. But we'll see. Meanwhile, let's go out to another newcomer here on the odd block. It's a weird day. A lot of biotechs in the news out there. So, of course, we're going to end on this, our cheapy biotech of the day. This is Glycomimetics, Inc., ticker symbol GLYC. I don't know what they make, but obviously they're a biotech out there, so I'm going to hazard a guess that has something to do with all this this wave of euphoria around all things COVID vaccines and treatments and effective therapies and whatnot. Uh, Ticker symbol said GLYC, trading $5.06 right now, up $0.40 or 8.6%. A year ago, they were trading nearly $10, $9.78, so they've had a bit of a rough, rough time, but again, this is a biotech, so these charts all look the same. They fell off a cliff back in August. They were trading nine and a quarter on August 1st, and then within a week, they were trading $2.80. So I'm guessing uh, the FDA ban hammer maybe came down, something along those lines. The trial didn't go the way they thought. Either way, this thing got clipped pretty hard, and then it was languishing there, but then slowly started rallying again. And by September, it was trading not quite five bucks, 467, and then by November, it was trading over five bucks. It was actually 640. So it had regained some of its former mojo out there. Then it started selling off again. And by the time of, right before the sell-off really started getting bad, it was down to four and a quarter. And then at the height of the madness in March, mid-March, they hit buck 82. So, crazy chart for a biotech. I guess, go figure. That's kind of what you expect. And it's been a long, slow climb ever since then. But they've done all right. They've come back from buck 83 slowly, slowly. And then the last few weeks, they started accelerating. They were at three bucks 
So they had almost doubled from the low. This was back at the end of June. And then all of a sudden, lately, in the last couple of weeks, they've added another two bucks to that climb pretty quickly. Pretty, uh, actually, they were 388 just a week ago. So they've added a buck and change just in the last week. So it's been a good run for them just in the near term. Let's see what we've got out here. It looks like someone perhaps thinking the parte is poised to continue. We got Deese Call Love, Mr. Rock Lobster. These things, <laughs> this is a, now this is the market. You, this, you call up your broker, you get this market, you hang up the phone and laugh at them, or maybe you weep. Uh, it's, it's market on these calls was $0.75 cents at $2.05, listeners. So kind of pick them wherever you want to go. Throw a dart in there somewhere in the middle, and hopefully you get filled. This guy settled out at a buck seventy-five for 3471 of these bad boys here. So lifting the offer for about 3500 of these Deese Fives, which are at the money calls right now, listeners. And these are hefty. If you're wondering how much juice this guy was paying, this guy was paying 158% in terms of IV out there. So <laughs> this is kind of almost the reason why the odd block was started for extremely rich calls in biotech, swinging for the fences. This one's weird on top of it because you have a stock that's a little more than 2x the total price of these calls. And this guy is swinging for the fences. So there's a lot to unpack here, Mr. Rock Lobster. We've got our cheapy but highly volatile biotech. This thing's been on a rampage just in the last couple of weeks. Someone's thinking the party is going to continue and paying a hell of a lot to do it. 158% volume. He needs this thing to move all the way into nearly 7 bucks. Of course, we all know practically in the real world it doesn't have to happen. He has to just gap up a bit and he'll look all right. But still... From the old break-even chart perspective, yes, he needs to move it to not quite 7 bucks. So a lot to unpack here. And also the notion that he's paying almost 50% of the value of the stock for these calls that will be worthless in Dece if the stock sits where it is. So a lot to unpack here, sir. What's your take on this old-school odd block biotech call paper here? I think my best old-school take is just... Um the fact that somebody paid 175 bid market and now there's a 180 bid in somebody's face for these options. So whoever accommodated the 3500, they just have to they get to suck on the mark right away. Um, so and actually 8700 have traded on the day. So just somebody's getting that first day. You know, didn't you love that first day? You put up a, some sort of trade and then the mark just runs you over like a. <laughs> <laughs> runs you over like a uh, um, uh, like a semi truck, uh, I guess is the easiest way to say it. So, you know, biotech world right now, I have to say that XBI, uh, I think all time highs. This COVID and you know everybody's like this is a time where just giddy 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 on um, uh, biotech again because of what? Um, because of the COVID nineteen vaccine possibility of vaccine treatments, you know. Buying everything in sight. So uh, I would say uh, on this case, that's that's what this is. And again, Alex would not be happy with a dollar seventy five call buy on a five dollar stock. But um, you know, it's. <laughs> but as of right now, the trade looks pretty good and not so good for the guy who accommodated it. Guy or girl? Guy or girl? Well, we'll come back to this one to see how this guy or girl feared. Yeah, old school biotech paper again. Another one. Where I hope the viceroy. Is not listening because he'll have a single tear in his eye. <laughs> but fascinating paper nonetheless. We're going to come back to this one and, and also IBM. We'll come back to all three of them. How's that, listeners? Three for three here in the odd block today. Let's see now if Uncle Mike can keep up with that high intensity, that high pace as we head on into the strategy block. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for The Strategy Block. All right, listeners, it's Monday. You know what that means. It's time to let Uncle Mike off the leash. Uncle Mike, sir, you are unleashed. I'm kind of scared to hand you a hot mic, but I'm willing to roll those dice. What do you got for us today, sir? Jumping at the bit. I want to talk today about two things. Uh, number one, how to understand the vulnerability of any strategy that you're doing. And number two, one of the specific ways that I understand my vulnerability that I've been talking about on this show ever since the COVID incident. So first off, I am a firm believer that there is nothing 
there's no such thing as a higher risk or a lower risk option trade. Obviously, 100 contracts is going to be higher risk than 10 contracts, of course. But I believe that different trades are shifted risk in different ways. Now, of course, there's pricing skews that could prove me wrong, but in theory, there's really not. So, for example, let's say that I am buying a stock. Okay, buying a stock is one strategy. And then strategy number two, let's say, is buying a stock with a married put. So which one is more risky? Well, of course, from a monetary standpoint, uh, just buying the stock is more risky because if the stock could go to zero, then uh, you wouldn't have any protection. Whereas if you buy a stock with a married put, you have protection to zero. So from a monetary standpoint, then just buying the stock outright would be more of a risky strategy. However, what about if the stock stays the same or goes higher? Well, if that's the case, then the time decay and the married put goes away. And so for basis of time decay, the married put is more risky. So where I'm going with this is that no matter what you do, there is no strategy that is of greater risk than another strategy. Risk is not greater or less from strategy to strategy. Risk is simply shifted. And, have the, and you have to have the understanding of how that risk is shifted. In the example that I said, the risk shifts from the, the risk of the stock going to zero from time decay running out on you. And if the stock goes to zero in a, with a married put, you don't care as much because you have the married put. However, if the stock stays the same or doesn't move that much, your risk is time decay. Once again, you're not getting rid of risk, you're shifting it. And so that's something that's very important to understand. Should I do uh, buy a stock or should I buy 10 call options? Well, how does the risk shift out? How does that work for you? That's what you really need to take a look at when deciding between strategies. Now, the second thing that I want to talk about today is what I've been doing since 2008. And so in 2008, I started my simulated index concept strategy with my own money uh, when I was working for Options Express uh, back in 2006. And so the concept was is that instead of investing in an index, just put 80 to 90% of your money in the 10-year note. I mean, after all, it's paying 4%, and that's never going to end, right? At least that's what I thought back in 2006. And then with the remainder of your cash, buy calls on SPY or SPX if you wanted the tax treatment because it was non-qualified money uh, or something along those lines within that concept. If the market goes lower, then you'll get that 4% yield from the 10-year note, and then that'll make up for a good portion of the premium that you lose when buying call options. Now, of course, that had to evolve a lot through the years. But in 2008, I'll never forget this. I remember thinking, okay, I'm going to just start with it. It's December 2007, had a good year with the strategy. I'm excited about it. And I pretty much decided that was going to be one of my staple strategies, and it still is to this day. And I remember the first trading day of 2008, the market's down. And so I think I had a morning meeting or something happened. I'm like, all right. So I was planning on just getting all my calls on for the day later in the day. And so the market was negative for the day. And I had every bit of ability to buy my calls or whatever it is I was going to do that day, whether it was a spread, whether it was a diagonal or whatever the case may be. And I I just didn't do it. I'm thinking, you know what? I'm going to make a new rule right now just to have some fun with this. I'm not going to get into the market this year until it actually goes positive. And so I was thinking, okay, maybe we'll, we'll go down a little bit. Or I was thinking maybe in the next day or two, I'd get into the market. But I just wanted to do a little experiment just to see what would happen. And of course, for those of us that were around in the business in 2008, well, we know what happened. And in December of that year, I just remember having big eyes and thinking, oh, my gosh. <laughs> and so from that point on, I made a rule for myself that if the market is negative on the year for the option trading section or for the bullish option trading section of my simulated index concept, I got to be out of it. And so that's a rule that I've stuck with for a long, long time. And it's really, it saved me a lot back in 2008. Uh, it saved me a lot uh, a couple of years ago when we have a down, had a down market. I just got out when we went negative later in the year and just basically took profits for the year. But in particular, it's helped me a lot this year. Now, with that, there's vulnerability to any strategy. What's my vulnerability to this strategy? 
and I just, I, this is the way that I explain this to clients all the time. I'm not fearful of the market dropping 30 to 40% with that strategy. Reason being, I'm usually, I'll, I'll lose a little bit, of course, but I'm not going to really lose that much money because I'm out. And of course, my rule is, is that if the market's negative on the year, then uh, I just don't have more than a 5% allocation. And that's 5% of the 10 to 20% that I'm using. And I've upped the ante a little bit on the percent that I use just because uh, the uh, the value of the S&P has gone higher since then. So sometimes it's 25% to 50%, but uh, and I'll have smaller positions. But regardless, my point is, is that if the market's negative, I'm not fearful of it because of the fact that, well, I'm in cash. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but bear markets will never hurt me. Uh, but with that, uh, the market can also go higher. My vulnerability if the market goes higher is if I'll miss the upside, if I don't have enough deltas on the table to match out what I want to do, uh, or the market goes higher and then maybe I put on too many deltas and then it pulls back. Of course, those are vulnerabilities. But the vulnerability that I want to talk about today is the one that's making me pull my hair out these days. Now, uh, in the option trading section of that strategy, I am ahead on the year. However, what drives me nuts about it is if the market's up one day, down one day, up one day, down one day. And by up and down, meaning up on the year, down on the year, up on the year, down on the year. Because once we're positive, of course, I got to stop my vulnerability of missing the upside. But then once we go negative, I got to get out of everything. And I'll be honest with you, this part of it is that vulnerability that drives me crazy. So how do I deal with this? Well, I had a rough year in 2015. That was actually one of the worst trading years of my life when the market was relatively flat and I got chopped out. Now, I lived to tell about it. I didn't lose that much, but it still was not a pleasant year in relation to the market. I actually had a negative year when the market was right, relatively flat, and that's not pleasant. You can't have too many of those and survive in this business, but um, I've always believed in full disclosure on this show, and uh, that was um, the relative to the market, the worst year that I ever had. So what am I doing? What have I done to modify that so that that doesn't happen again? Well, with that, if we're having a market to where we're just skating along the flat line for the year, the unched mark on the year, as Mark Longo would like to say, I got to do smaller positions and I can't buy a lot of premium. So in other words, if I'm selling put spreads out of the money, then by doing that, market can, of course, chop me out. But with that, if I have less than a 5% allocation or if the market does go positive and I still have a smaller al allocation, more than 5%, and then if I'm wrong, it won't bite so badly. So with that, what I've come to the conclusion of is that, I, number one, I am vulnerable in a market like this. But number two, if the market goes higher, because SPY right now, 322 is about the close of 2019 on SPY. And if the market does start to go higher, then I'm prepared to miss out from 322 to, say, 325 something along those lines. And by doing that, I can buy an out-of-the-money call spread, which I've done a couple times. Uh, and that way, if it goes against me, I can get out of it relatively quickly for a minimal loss. Um, or what I like to do when it's right on the borderline is sell put spreads. And I like selling them relatively close, maybe even a few days to a month out. But by doing that, if the market does just kind of go sideways for a little bit, then I have time decay working with me and helping me to where if I get chopped out, then it's not going to bite as bad. No, I won't get the big, uh, powerful upside of the market, but I can get a start to it, build up a little cushion. And then at that point, once we're at the 325, 326 level, should we go back there? Then it's game on and I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm doing what I do again in terms of uh, selling a little bit tighter put spreads, sell, uh, buying call options, buying call spreads, things like that with larger amounts of money. I have a little bit of a cushion to where if I get chopped out again, that's I'm still ahead on the year. So moral of the story is that have an understanding of where you're vulnerable and what are you going to do to get through the vulnerable stage of your strategy? Now, I didn't mention my favorite part of this strategy and my favorite thing to do when I'm in this situation. Don't trade. Sit in cash. It's okay for a while. Not everybody wants to do that, but that's probably my favorite thing to do. And uh, I'll be honest, that's what I'm doing today. <laughs> so that is the strategy block for today. Uh, back to you, Mark. And what we're doing today is we're going around the block. 
It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right. What are we watching for the rest of this week until we all gather here together on Thursday? Well, first off, a little recap on the markets. Markets have turned green. Apparently, they're all feeling the boost of optimism baked into this vaccine information, perhaps, or something else is lifting up. I've got to wager it's probably the former out there, but there's always unknown unknowns flirt, flirting out there. S&P is up about six-tenths of a percent now. The Dow has now flipped to the green, up about a tenth of a percent. NASDAQ still off to the races out there. The only, only name that's still the laggard are small caps. They're not feeling the vaccine optimism off about half a percent. So they have not even about four-tenths of a percent. So they have mitigated their sell-off somewhat, but still not feeling... The love out there. Let's see what our cohorts here are feeling and what indeed they're keeping an eye on until our next episode on Thursday. Let's start with the rockingest of lobsters. Mr. Rock Lobster, sir, what is on your radar as we all try to make sense of this continued madness that is the market these days, sir? <laughs> um, you know what? I, I try not to spend too much time making sense of anything. It just it's what it is. <laughs> so... Um, we're back to around that all time high place. The cues are back to around that all time. I mean, spy back to, uh, kind of COVID highs right there. Cues definitely, I mean, give or take a couple of ticks. Right. Um, so I, I think at this point, uh, between the biggest thing is checks coming from the government until the COVID is over and people think we'll just monetize it into the future and everything will be fine. So as of right now, um, it just, it just appears we're waiting for a heavy dose. Um, and even like waiting for the heavy dose of technology, you know, like what if Tesla goes to 2000 and people thinking crazy thoughts, but if it gets out of the S and P 500, <laughs> you know, where does it go? So I'm just saying there's there's a lot of crazy town, but it really doesn't matter because, you know, that's what the stock market is. It's uh, it is a collection. So that's what I'm as far as looking at right now. Good tech earnings could certainly push things higher. Um, uh, but at this point, you, you figure you need some sort of real economic news to make stocks go higher. But um, as of right now, uh, it doesn't appear that way. It's just the, the possibility that something might happen well in the future is, is getting things moving. Yeah, I'm feeling you out there, sir. <laughs> At some point, you need some economic impact to be measured. But hey, right now, we're all living in crazy town and have been pretty much since about January 6th or so. Of the, we had that brief respite, that first week of the year. Oh, I wish we could all go back to that, how young and idyllic and innocent. All was right with the world. <laughs> and then it all fell apart and never really has looked back. But maybe, who knows? Markets are not are not feeling. Markets think we're back to that already. So... Uh, perhaps we're – it's like I Am Legend at the end of I Am Legend, Mr. Rock Lobster. The book, not the crazy Will, Will Smith movie where all the vampires say, wait a minute. No, you're the human. You're the legend. You're the one that's out of place. We're the right ones. Maybe the market has all become the vampires and we are indeed the legend. We'll, we shall see. We shall see. Maybe it's an I Am Legend kind of market. Mr. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, are you indeed the legend as well? What are you watching for the rest of this week, sir? Oh, I like to think of myself as a lot of things, but a legend I am not. Uh, I'm just watching the this S and P. Want to see if it's positive or negative, or possibly both, and uh, try not to go too crazy. That's what I'm watching for the most part. I'm also watching uh, any COVID news that comes out. Uh, until we get a vaccine, it's really not real good news, folks, and that's not going to be for a while. I hate to be a doom and gloomer, but uh, in the COVID world, until we get that vaccine, uh, we're not really going to get the real good news that we need. And I'm talking from a market standpoint. Of course, it's good news if the death rate becomes less or the case numbers become less. Uh, of course, we all want that. But from the standpoint of the markets, the real good news comes when we have a proven vaccine and it's going to be the biggest vaccine news since polio. Take that, Jonas Salk, in your face. Portfolio vaccine. We're coming for you. With the COVID vaccine. What a, what a day that will be. What a party day. That will be when the when the vaccine is approved and we know it's effective and it's getting out to the masses and it's not killing large amounts of people. It's actually being effective. Man, now it makes the roaring 20s make a little bit more sense. After the pandemic comes the massive party. Uh, the roaring 20s after the Spanish flu, the renaissance, 
after the Black Death. Hey, people forget about that. The Renaissance came about almost entirely because of the Black Death, at least there in Europe. So interesting stuff, perhaps, afoot once we finally have this vaccine behind us. And, of course, this show, unfortunately, is behind us. We'll be saying, hey, you need a little more. Don't worry, we've got you covered. We'll be bringing crypto to you, actually, sooner than normal, probably not that long after the show. So if you're listening live, stay put. We'll break down all the fun things going on in the world, the crypto derivatives, the options, the futures, the ball, the volume, the volatility, the open interest, all that good stuff, and a lot more. But before we do that, let's go around the horn again. Let's start with the list of Mike's. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, while I'm waiting for this vaccine party to begin, outside of that, of course, the markets have kind of been in, you could argue they've been in vaccine party mode since March 23rd or so, but hey, that's a conversation for another day. Mr. Uncle Mike, while I'm waiting for this party to begin... And I want to call someone, maybe to talk me off the ledge. Where should I go? What should I do? StCharlesWealth.com. We'll, we'll talk. We'll have our own uh, Zoom call vaccine uh, party, uh, if you will. Uh, we'll socially distant. We'll do all that stuff. And, uh, one thing that I'm not socially distant from is option trading. That is something that the virus cannot take away from me, even if I get it. Uh, and it'll, at least till I die anyway. <laughs> and, uh, we'll talk option trading because uh, options aren't for everybody. But uh, Mark Longo has the compliant right to contradict me on that statement. I do indeed. No compliance shall tell me otherwise. Options are for everybody. Get out there, start trading. Get your grandma in an options account now. Have her start slinging it up. <laughs> in a risk-appropriate manner, of course. And Mr. Rock Lobster, if my grandmother wants to come learn options... Where should she go? What should she do? Hey, come to OptionPit.com. Look at our memberships tab. Uh, you got the Ball Edge having a good year. Uh, you got the uh, Ball Trading Club having a good year. You got um, uh, Sharp Bets having a good year. Uh, the trading, all kinds of stuff. Everything's going well. So there you go. You got. You want to get your option learning on? Come on over to Option Pit and, and get her going. Get her done at Option Pits. Dot com. And on behalf of the Rock Lobster and Uncle Mike and the legend, indeed, myself, hopefully the vampires won't come and get me, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, for streaming, for subscribing, for listening live, for sending in your questions and your comments, for following along with us on social media, all the other fun stuff that you do. Keep it coming. If you need more and listen to live, we'll be back pretty soon. Break down all the world of crypto derivatives. Otherwise, if you're listening after the fact, just hit next. Something's going to be waiting for you there on the network. A lot of cool stuff coming at you. Boot camp coming at you this week again. Of course, OPR later this week. Grind will be back from vacation, so some fresh new episodes for you guys there. Of course, we got Vol Views come up later this week. we got Volatility Views on Friday. Of course, we got Twifo on Thursday. And, of course, once again on Thursday for more of The Option. Listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>